All right. Hello, Fortinos, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is September 29th, 2024, and we got some more digging to do. You can see uh, I have a lot of tabs open as usual, but I believe most likely, probably, we won't do this, this latter portion over here because it really jumps from one conversation into quite a different conversation it kind of it leads and it, it, it you'll see by the end of this portion it leads into what's coming next but i think i'm going to save that to go much deeper into the second part um in most likely i would assume the next teaching god willing that's where we're going to go and uh just tie in some things in that next one to things we've we've recently like within the last oh maybe whatever couple months or so that we've talked about in the mountain of the Lord and and show some things and try to get a better grasp of what might be coming before to clearly what we can see what's coming after, whether it be seals and trumpets and so forth. And even though this kind of had a tie in, it doesn't really go into that direction. So we're going to cover this stuff here today. So in it, what we're going to be doing is actually tying more connections to this last teaching to the timing it showed, what it tells us about it, what's happening in the sun, moon, and stars at that time, it's it's pretty wild. And the 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 portion of this really comes from a brother of ours. Um, he posted it in the forum, but I'm not sure if it's him who posted it in the forum, if that was his name. Uh, but it's from our brother, uh, Link78, I think it is. He's been with Ministry Revealed for a long time, and... Um, we we don't you know like most of us we don't agree on absolutely everything but the foundational of everything and he's been tracking things with uh with constellations in particular one and this star and its meaning and it was pretty wild i went in to dig a little bit deeper because i think a lot of people are thinking you know seven to eight days later than what we're talking about and i'm going to show how it ties into the seven or eight days earlier as we taught in this one, and what that eighth day, that seventh to the eighth day equals and how it pertains to this star with this constellation and so forth. It's really, really quite wild. And when you see the wording connected to it, it's it's precise. It's so exciting. So we're going to go into that. We're going to show a few clips here and there. I'm even going to show one dream from a little girl. It was posted in the forum as well. And you guys know I'm not a overly huge fan of uh, dreams and visions. There's too many people out there that are just dreaming of cheeseburgers. Um, you know, thinking of cheeseburgers all day, and then they have a dream about cheeseburgers and think it was from the Lord. And sometimes they might be, and they're just personal, but for the most part, it's just a bunch of cheeseburgers. And so it's not always easy to discern. But when you have understanding of Scripture, when there are things that you do understand, that you that you that you've come to understand then you can always go to the scriptures and see how these things might tie in and that's what this this little girl who was eight years old her dream and the reason i'm sharing it and the reason it was shared in the forum is because of the connections it has based on the last teaching what it talks about and i want to tie it into this because i thought it was pretty exciting uh the wording in it what happens to her where she was taken uh, I thought it was all very telling. So with that, anybody who's new to the ministry, you just heard me talk about uh, the forum. You can go to ministryrevealed.com right here. And in the menu, click on forum. If you want to be with like-minded brothers and sisters from around the world, there's over 1,200 in there. Um, we're, we're sharing events and, and prayer requests. And people are gathering together in person from around the world that meet there. Um, you know, news and events, Bible studies, all sorts of things going on in there. You can come and join us in there. It's free. It takes you a few seconds to sign up. And um, yeah, come and join us. Like-minded brothers and sisters, those seeking and searching, watching and praying and, and diligently seeking the Lord in his word to, to be ready, right? To be prepared and to be ready for this time we believe is very, very near at hand. So with that, also if you're new, 
You can find this on ministryrevealed.com on what we call the intro series uh, from the menu. Or you can come to YouTube, the playlist right here, and click on Intro to the End Times Revelation. This is the Revealed End Times Study Notes series. And if you're new, watch the first four videos. That's all I ask. You can watch today. You can follow it along. I'm sure you'll be able to grasp it and understand it. But you're going to hear things throughout these teachings in relation to who the Gospels are speaking to. That the tribulation isn't seven years, but a period of time called 14 years and a short period of time called above, which relates to 50 days. And what happens is most people think it's crazy because they've only understood or ever been taught seven years. Well, what you're going to understand in these four first videos in this is precisely what revealed that understanding. And it starts... In the first video, it's only a 22-minute intro, and it gives you a little insight as to what the next three teachings will be about. The second video is a 30-minute Bible study with Scripture to begin to give you an understanding of what it means when we say the, the differences in the Gospels and who the Gospels are speaking to. You're going to see that in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke in the end of days equal Luke, Mark, and Matthew. Yet we've all been taught from the Gospel of Matthew. And we only go to Mark and Luke to try to fill in blanks of what is in Matthew. It was never understood who Mark and Math and Luke were really speaking to. And so they were just kind of set aside as, as other Gospels to fill in the blanks in Matthew. Well, the reality is the last will be first and the first will be last. And when you begin to understand... These differences in the Gospels that people will claim they're either contradictories or they're just perspective and all of these things. You're going to see that the reality is they are all prophecy. They are all prophecy. We have gone into dozens and dozens and dozens of them over the years to prove the truth that what they are saying is prophetic and that it's speaking to different groups in their portions of time in the years to come. The was is from creation to Christ. The is is from Christ until the moment of the pre-trib. And the is to come is from the moment of the pre-trib unto the end. It's always in threes. Was, is, is to come. Pre, mid, post are all true. You'll begin to discover that in this as well. Uh, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Over and over and over again. Okay? Even the enemy plays it. You have Satan, you have Lucifer, and you have the false prophet. Or Satan, the beast, and the false prophet. It plays over and over and over again. The end of days, even though it's 14 years for the tribulation portion, and a portion called above, which is 50, it really is a picture of the final three sevens of a jubilee cycle of seven times seven years. But the first seven are quote-unquote easy. Then you've got the final 50 days of it, and then you've got seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets. Okay? That's how it ends up playing out. But it's impossible to understand it if you don't go from that, that intro of who the Gospels are speaking to to be able to see these things. You'll see things like in Luke, Jesus was arrayed in a gorgeous robe before going to the cross, which means radiant, white, beautiful, white, right? Like a bride. But in Mark, he was arrayed in purple. And in Matthew, he was arrayed in scarlet. Do you know that purple and scarlet are the colors of tribulation of the woman riding the beast? You see, you're going to see little insights like this or things like when Christ went to the cross and the final words. And if you ask just about anybody, they'll say the last words by Jesus on the cross were, were my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, that's found in Matthew and it's found in Mark. But in Luke, he says, Father, into your arms, I commend my spirit. Very different than Mark and Matthew because they're tribulation colors, right? Mark and Matthew, both going, they're going through seals and through trumpets through the other portion. And what you come to find out is that the word forsaken in the Strong's Concordance means to leave behind. Now, Jesus didn't think he was being left behind. So what's the purpose of that definition of forsaken being left behind? It's because the Mark group and the Matthew group. You're going to see that what follows in the third video is the revelation of the 14 years. It's a 30-minute intro to begin to help you understand 
the truth of the end of days. 50 days, a portion called above, and then 14 years. And in it, you're going to see that Luke is pre, Mark is mid, and Matthew is post. They're all true, which is why everybody can go to Scripture and stand on a pre-trib or a mid-trib or a post-trib return of the Lord. Because they're all in Scripture. We show that they're all true, and they're all true over a period called above and 14 years. That's what you'll see in the 30-minute Bible study of the third video. In the fourth video, that one is a big one. It's about 2 hours and 45 minutes, and it's called It's All Because of Matthew. And the reason it's called that is because it's all because of Matthew. We have all been taught from the Gospel of Matthew for centuries, never understanding who Mark and Luke were speaking to in the Synoptic Gospels. And because of it, everything we have ever learned is founded in the Gospel of Matthew. Hence, the reason everybody only understands seven years. And when you go deeper into these videos, once you get past those four and you go deeper, you're going to see the Gospels in their discourses revealed in order. You're going to understand why there's such a difference in Luke's and why Mark sounds similar to Matthew, but still quite different. And why Matthew's continues on, not only in Matthew 24, but also into Matthew 25. And the end of days will open to you as it, is never ha as it never has in your life. I promise you, it's done that to tens of thousands of us around the world. So that fourth video, it's all because of Matthew, will help you to understand how all of this was missed. And it all goes back to one, it wasn't yet the time as the Lord has revealed it over the last seven years. Two, it's because everybody was taught from the Gospel of Matthew. And having been taught from the Gospel of Matthew, the only thing anybody ever sees is seven years of tribulation because that's the second final seven years of the trumpet judgments, which are Matthew's. They've missed Mark's and they've missed Luke's portion. And in that, they believe that the entirety of creation will only be 7,000 years by the end of the millennial reign and have missed the other portions of creation and what Genesis tells us about it. When you understand Luke, Mark, and Matthew, oh my goodness, it goes so much deeper and so much further than we had ever, ever understood. And it's all there for us in Scripture. So if you're new, you can watch today, but go ahead and definitely make a note to go watch those first four videos. All right. So let's get started with this. So we know where where we're looking for, right, according to the last one. So here we are today, September 29th. And based on the year's end and the count and all those things, this is Shmini Aretz, the great eighth day, and this is is the beginning of the 50 days. So whether it's evening to evening as the Jews have it, or whether it's daytime, right? Sunrise to sunrise. It may very well be that it's sunrise to sunrise. Like very early at the time of dawn would be the time of the escape, okay? So understanding this, having studied this, we then know that we have day one, day two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then we have the eighth day, okay? So again, if we go evening to evening as the Jews do, even if we go daytime, sunrise to sunrise, on our side of the world in the West, it's still going to be in the evening of the 24th, okay? So it's always easier to just say like this. We can say evening to evening, even though it might be, you know, dawn on the, the, the beginning of it, okay? So... You have your one, two, three, four, five, six, seven days. And then from here to here is the eighth day. This eighth day, remember, this is the beginning of the 50 days. The escape happens first. An attack happens on Israel. The world is in a panic. There's a seven-day wedding taking place in heaven. And the Lord, as the Son of Man, returns on the eighth day right here. And when he returns, he is going to fulfill the Son of Man as Jonah was. He's going to fulfill the Son of Man for the 40 days as it was in the days of Noah. Not from Matthew 24, but from Luke 17. Okay? And the 40 days will continue. Then there will be about three days left. The anointing of the Holy Ghost will come on the 50th day. 
and then Syria will have compassed about Jerusalem and Jerusalem will be attacked. The Jews will all have fled or been killed and some taken captive. And that is the beginning of the 14 years in World War III. We have been teaching on this from the revelation of Scripture for years. And the reason we've been so diligent this year since June, go especially in particular since August, is because the revelation that Scripture has shown us is that this is the 70th year of Israel. When you understand the count of when they came into the land in 1948, and you count it as Leviticus 19 says, when they came into the land and have planted all manner of trees, and then they're the house of Judah, so their count begins in the fall. So their count begins in the fall, doesn't begin in the spring like the house of Israel. Then the 14 year, or then the, the count of uh, Leviticus 19 begins. Three years, you can't take anything of it. Fourth year is to the Lord. And then the fifth year forward is theirs. So what are we in right now? We are literally in a count from 1949 to now in the 70th year or the 75th. But remember, five and 70. So you add the four and then you count your 70. You're, we're in the 75th year, which makes it the 70th because it was five and 70. Okay. That puts us to no other option. I have racked my brain through all the revelations of seven years of everything we've been going through, of everything the Spirit has led us in through all of this incredible revelation. I cannot see another place because we have gone from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation. We know 70 is the key. When 70 comes to an end, the 14 years begin. But we've been trying to understand where it is. Is this the end of 70 years? No, it can't be. Because there's the above portion, which is 50. Which means there's something else that we've understood, which is the calendars being off by two months. So we're going to get into that. We're going to touch on that a little bit as well to show what it equals and how we already taught on it four years ago and throughout the years. But we just never fully saw, well, will the Lord carry it through to where his true uh, uh, 14 years would begin where his true feast of trumpets is well we're going to talk about that as well we're going to touch on that i'm going to show you what it equals and you're not going to believe it i kind of mentioned it in the previous one but remember we were looking from the eighth of av and then the ninth of av beginning because of zechariah chapter seven from zechariah chapter one and then the end of the 50 days being the end and then the fasting and mourning of the seventh, right from the attack that would begin at the time of the Feast of Trumpets. Well, you're going to see that what we're talking about here in account from here equals the exact same count as this one from here to here, but on the corrected calendar of being two months off. It's wild. All right? So... We, we have an understanding. We've spoken on this. We, it was a great video. The last teaching was really exciting. I know many people have been messaging me saying they've been watching it, oh, some of them three, four, five plus times. It's crazy. It was one of those videos that really, really got people saying, wait a second. Oh, my goodness. That really does make sense. Because we needed to understand where there was a year's end. And it lined up with the Gospel of John because, you know, you will have heard me if you're new that it goes Matthew, Mark, Luke for the synoptics. But in the end, it's Luke, Mark, Matthew. Well, what about John? John stands on his own and he has 21 chapters. You'll remember I said there's seven easy years, right, where, where people are being prepared. And then there's seven years of seals and then there's seven years of trumpets. Well, John's Gospel has 21 chapters. It turns out that's for a reason because there's a prophetic revelation in those chapters that relate to the years in the days in the end of days which means we are in the 70th which is in the seventh year and 50 days before it ends all of this begins but what we're looking for is a year's end but there's also another type and you're going to see that with this constellation conversation here today. Okay? <clears throat> it's pretty wild.
just it, it's so wild. So that's why, you know, in the last teaching, I wasn't expecting we were going to go. I was going to keep going down this route. But with this with this incredible piece of 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 um, uh, uh, this incredible piece that was shown through our buddy, brother's video and the things that he posted in the forum, I went and looked into it a little bit further. And most people think it connects to here. But the reality is the connection is still here. And this is about the Son of Man coming on the eighth day. You're going to see why it's incredibly wild as I break this down because of the Son. Because of the deception of the Son, which we've been talking about for a few years now. Because the Son is off course. All right? So, to show how close we are right now, what do we know is happening, is going to happen during this time? It's going to begin with the pre-trib bride of Christ. She won't experience anything. That's why in Luke 21, 36, even before Luke's discourse, which is that 40, 50 day period of time, Luke's discourse in 21, 36 says, watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the son of man. Okay. The pre-trib is taken out first and then the 50 days begin, and it starts with an attack on northern Israel, as we've talked about for a long time. We've talked about it, saying that it would be Iran that will bring an attack on Haifa and Tel Aviv and bring some great destruction there, okay? But it won't last long. This Middle Eastern war that will break out from it, even though you might say it's already happening, this will be much greater. Because Haifa and Tel Aviv will be literally attacked. Not completely destroyed, but devastated. And this war will last for about seven days. And it will be settled. And then the Son of Man is going to show up. We know he's going to be rejected. Many of the Jews will believe on him. You know, a number of people will. But the by far, the world is going to reject him. That's what he talks about as his 40 days as Noah's in Luke 17. That he would be rejected during this time okay he is coming to fulfill luke 11 as as jonah was so shall the son of man be to this generation which refers to the the final generation when you read that in scripture so <clears throat> so when considering everything that's been going on in israel for the past year when you consider the last teaching and how we showed that this right here is the Hebrew calendar anniversary, which was last year in 2023, equaled October 7th, was the 22nd day of Tishri, okay? Last year, October 7th was the 22nd day of Tishri. This year, October 24th is the 22nd day of Tishri. This is the one year, quote unquote, according to a Hebrew count, the one year anniversary to that attack. Well, we know that it equals 383 days and there's seven days left to when it would be over which was 390 from ezekiel chapter uh four when ezekiel chapter four's 390 days are over october 31st who shows up the son of man who will now warn jerusalem the jews for 40 days just like the prophecy revealed when he comes for 40 days okay these things we spoke about in the last one so what are we looking for here? Pre-trib and then an attack by Israel. Uh, uh, sorry, an attack by Iran on Haifa and Tel Aviv. Well, let's have a look to see how chaotic it's getting. You guys have heard, uh, obviously, all of these things going on around the world right now, uh, especially over in the Middle East, and how Israel just recently, like in the last couple of days or so, took out the head of Hezbollah. So all of their top, what, 15, 20 or so that were all on the terror watch list in America that they couldn't get for 20 years, Israel has taken them out just in the last few months and the majority of them just in the last couple days with that last strike, okay? Well, you're going to see what's left. If Hamas is pretty much decimated, if all of the leadership of Hezbollah has been destroyed and the other ones with their pagers all blown up and their phones and all that other stuff, their walkie-talkies, well, anybody that matters has been pretty much eliminated or has 
it doesn't have this communication. So what's left? Iran. Iran is what's left. Well, this was shared today in the forum, um, and this is what Jared Kushner posted. Jared Kushner, you know, I don't often publicly say it, and I'm not going to say it now, but some of you understand who I believe Kushner may end up being. But he's a very smart guy. He he put together the Abrahamic Accords, all of these things, right? He was very, very involved. But I'm going to, you know, that's not for now. I want to show you what he posted about what happened on September 27th. Let's have a read of what he says. September 27th is the most important day in the Middle East since the Abraham Accords breakthrough. Uh, I have spent countless hours studying Hezbollah, and there is not an expert on earth who thought that what Israel has done to decapitate and degrade them was possible. This is significant because Iran is now fully exposed. Ta-da! Iran is now fully exposed exposed the reason why their nuclear facilities have not been destroyed despite weak air defenses is because hezbollah has been a loaded gun pointed at israel iran spent the last 40 years building its capability as a deterrent okay speaking about hezbollah donald trump would often say iran has never won a war but never lost a negotiation the islamic republic's regime is much tougher when risking Hamas, Hezbollah, Syria, and Houthi lives than when risking their own. Their foolish efforts to assassinate President Trump and hack his campaign reek of desperation and are hardening a large coalition against them. Iranian leadership is stuck in the old Middle East while their neighbors, the GCC, are sprinting toward a future by investing in their populations and infrastructure. They are, becoming a they are becoming dynamic magnets for talent and investment while Iran falls behind while Iran falls behind. As the Iranian proxies and threats dissipate, regional security and prosperity will rise for Christians, Muslims, and Jews alike. Not in the end of days, they won't. Not for the Jews and Christians. Not yet, anyways. Israel now finds itself. The tar uh, uh, with the threat from Gaza mostly neutralized and the opportunity to neutralize Hezbollah in the north. It's unfortunate how we got here, but maybe there can be a silver lining in the end. Anyone who has been calling for a ceasefire in the north is wrong. There is no going back for Israel. They cannot afford now to not finish the job and completely decimate the arsenal that has been aimed at them they will never get another chance. Hello. We don't need to read all of it. The main point is what we're reading here. That Iran is now exposed. Iran is exposed. Their proxies have been decimated. But don't forget, Iran has a really big army. And they most likely have nuclear capability. But there was a reason why Israel never went and attacked. And it's because of the proxies, but it's also because Iran has a big army. Well, guess what? If now there's no time to turn back, you know, there's no turning back now? Israel's got to keep pushing it? Well, of course they do. You see, there's only two options in relation to the end of days and how it starts. It's either going to be that in this, Iran will make the first strike and, and attack Haifa and Tel Aviv before an attack comes against them from Israel because they know it's coming, right? Especially on their facilities. Or Israel will continue its attack to destroy the facilities and Iran will retaliate, okay? It seems, as from what I'm going to show you, that it will be Israel that will continue and make the attack as they've been aggressing really, really, you know, they've been very aggressive and they know that it's time not to hold back, right? They have to take care of this now. Thinking that, oh, when it's over, we can all live in peace. No, nope. we know that that's not what's coming, right? The Lord is preparing everybody in their position. 
Time's about to start. So it would appear that it's going to be Israel that attacks so that Iran and those maybe siding with Iran can retaliate. And we know it will be Iran and maybe with others working with Iran that will bring about this strike on Haifa and Tel Aviv. Now watch this. Have a listen to this. You guys remember this video. I've been talking about this video now for over four years. This was the video that came to me from Jodell on the same day in the same email she sent me back on uh, March 11th, early in the morning, like 1 o'clock or whatever it was in the morning, on March 11th, 2020, when I had done the video that revealed Taurus and right on target and that it was from the Holy Spirit to confirm it, she included this video. Now, we've shared on it a number of times over the years, and now more than ever, it's worth a listen. Okay? Let's see what's going to take place. To try and roll out the sequence of events. Now, what he describes is what the sequence of events was. It starts with Israel attacking Iran. No, it hasn't happened yet. There have been a number of indications that, that, that there are forces which are trying to, to, to push this into happening. You've only got to follow the news for the last two years to realize that the public is being prepared for a justification for this kind of thing. Iran is being set up as being the bad guys that deserve something to happen to them and so on and so forth. Now, that's going to be the start of what is like the opening gambit in a big chess game. And the plan is to provoke Iran or China to retaliate. And our guy, our source, who is a military man, is privately as convinced as he can be although this has never been made public and this is not publicly known, that Iran does have nuclear weapons. He believes that they have been provided by China behind the scenes. And all of this is intended because it's all right with these controlling forces that Iran has nuclear weapons because they want them to be used. The plan is for either Iran or for China to retaliate after Iran is struck with a nuclear weapon. At that point, there will be a limited nuclear exchange in the Middle East, followed by a ceasefire. He heard this being planned in this meeting. This is being choreographed. It's like the script for a movie. This is exactly what's intended to happen. Okay. So we've heard that before, right? They, they have this plan. They have planned this for decades to happen. But they needed to provoke Israel enough to finally go against them. And, and Iran and its proxies enough to come against Israel even more. These things were planned. This video, as you guys remember is 14 years old. How fitting is that, right? From 2010. It's from 2010 from this guy who went into a this meeting, a very specific high-level meeting back in 2005. And they'd been talking about this as something they'd been planning for decades. Decades, brothers and sisters. And it was to provoke Israel to attack them first so that in return... Iran and or with China to retaliate against Israel. And when you go deeper into this, one of the biggest things is because they want to stop China. They want to stop the growth, the taking over that would come from China. That's what a lot of this leads to. And of course, depopulation and all these things. But you saw what happened. It's talking about uh, uh, this plan, right? That, that they've expected this. They've worked on this. They, they, they've been working on it for decades. And that it would be what? Short-lived. It would be a short Middle Eastern war that would end with a ceasefire. We've been talking about this for years. What is this talking about? It's talking about the escape that happens. And right after the escape, Israel is attacked most likely after you see it would make sense that israel would attack iran just as the plan shows and that after that attack iran retaliates with or without china but iran retaliates and uh, um brings destruction to haifa and tel aviv the two northern cities and what happens when they do it's going to be a short middle east war that will be short short it will last for about seven days and then there will be a ceasefire. And then who shows up? The Son of Man at the end of the 290 days 
that was the sign to the house of Israel, then the Son of Man comes and begins his 40 days from October 31st and warns for 40 days to the house of Judah. Why do they stop this Middle East war after about a week? Because they don't want to go to full out war yet. They're trying to avoid potential World War III. At least some are trying to. But we know in reality, behind the scenes, those that are in control, they don't want to stop it. World War III is what their intention is to bring about a new order. So listen to the rest of this. Listen to this. To hear what comes next. Now, you're gonna, you might hear in part of this where it talks about the, a global pandemic would break out and, uh, and it was devastation on China and it was spread throughout the world. Well, that's already happened. We shared on this when that happened. That's why it was so powerful when I got this 12 hours before a global pandemic was declared and everybody had to go home. Because the, the mystery, the thing that was in here is the understanding of the revelation of the end. An attack by Iran on Haifa and Tel Aviv as the retaliation after Israel. And then it would settle. And then would come World War III. That's exactly it. You know, we've seen these types of things all over the place. Even right here. Remember this in 2nd Ezra? Uh, Behold, the days are coming when the Most High will deliver those who are on the earth. This is the pre-trib. And bewilderment of mind shall come on those who dwell on the earth. Okay? Everybody's going to be caught off guard in bewilderment while there's an attack it, with Israel and, uh, uh, and, and Iran. And then what does it say? And they shall plan to make war against one another. City against city, place against place, people against people, kingdom against kingdom. This isn't that first attack with Haifa and Tel Aviv. This is the red horse rider that begins when Jerusalem is then attacked and destroyed. That's the beginning of World War III. Well, this is what the guy's going on to talk about. To spread like wildfire and to knock out a large number of the Chinese people. And these people in this meeting were laughing about this. They said, China will catch a cold. Those were their words. China will catch a cold. And they were laughing about the fact that these biological weapons will, will wreak havoc among the Chinese population. And after that, then what effectively will be a kind of plague will actually spread right across the world to the West as well. Uh, so I was not clear whether this was a Chinese retaliation or whether the thing would just spread out of control in the way that it would be very understandable if it did, whether it's racially targeted or not, these things actually mutate. So now you've got a situation where there's been a limited nuclear war in the Middle East. There's a pandemic that really is sweeping across the world and really is killing people very visibly. And you've got this totalitarian military lockdown in all the governments in the Western worlds so because everyone's going to be in panic about all of this. And then, he said, then the real war starts something that would be justifiably called the third world war with a much more major there you go you see this is what's coming this is things we've been talking about for a long time yes the world talks about it those who are watchmen those who who seek these things in the news and the understanding and break them down a lot of them on youtube but prophetically we've understood this timing it's just always 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 been a matter of when lord what is the connection? Where is this year's end? Where is this circuit of the sun after? Where is this other year? Where, you know, where is this true timing of the 70th year? Well, this video was the video that came to me with the confirmation from the Holy Ghost about being right on target, which revealed Taurus, the bullseye, the eye of Taurus, and revealed that in the beginning, Taurus was the beginning it's wild stuff it's wild wild stuff so what we're going to see when we go a little bit further later on is this connection to this timing meaning you know if it's two months off is it possible then that wherever this starts and wherever it ends in the 14 years begin does it turn out to actually equal if we continued the two-month-off count as Taurus being the beginning of the year? Well, guess what? Wait until you see that. It is absolutely perfect, and it makes it 
another reason to say it is the absolute last option from this point this year. It is the absolute final possibility at this point. Because where it ends is directly connected to what we were saying from August 12th to October 2nd. It's the exact same thing, only in account that follows the two months off. Yet it starts with the end of the Hebrew calendar, just as John 7 into John 8 did, which is chapters to years. Wild. Absolutely wild. So we're going to go into that more. But now let's go into this little girl's dream I was telling you about. We're not going to go into everything. We'll go from 250 to 648, which really is, you know, where the where the mother's friend is uh, is talking about this dream. So I wanted to share it because of certain things that were said that I found were very, very powerful uh, for us in what we've understood. Remember what I said about dreams and visions and so forth? Well, this is one that has a connection to what we talk about. So let's have a listen. Um, so she's in her room. Um, she's asleep. Obviously, she's dreaming. This is a dream. And um, it is Halloween. It is Halloween. And all of a sudden, her room turns fully gold. All everything. She said everything became gold in her room. Um, and, she, and then she said... Um, the Lord Jesus Christ appeared and he appeared at the door. And I believe the door just um, disappeared as he arrived, as he arrived. And she said he arrived um, on a white horse. And um, she said, I know everyone knows that, that drawing of Aiken um, that she, when she was eight years old, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> but anyways, when Aiken was eight years old, she drew that picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, she described him exactly like that. <clears throat> and she said he was wearing a, a white robe with a red shawl that had some yellow and white in it. Um, <clears throat> then he um, started looking at, she so maybe I'll pause right there just to make the first point. She said it was Halloween and the Lord appeared on a white horse. Hello. Can you say hello? This is precisely what we've been sharing that when the Son of Man comes, he is the first seal, white horse rider. One of the seals was opened, and he goes out. He is the white horse rider. We've got a great video explaining it with a picture of a white horse on it. If you don't understand, go and watch it. He is the white horse rider, the one who's coming for 40 days, who is the son of man on the white horse rider. We know when he comes. He's coming after the seven-day wedding, which ends right here. And he's coming on the eighth day. Halloween. Halloween. Pretty funny how that works, right? That's why this really caught my attention and why it caught others and they posted it in the forum. She, she draws pictures and journals and everything for the Lord, I believe, like at night, maybe throughout the day, I don't know, but specifically at night right before she goes to bed. And he got off of his horse and started like reading all of her things and looking at all the pictures that she drew for him. And... um. <clears throat> Um, then he, um, got her hand and they walked across the room and they walked across her room and they went up to the window. He took her up to the window hand in hand. Then he let go of her hand and he put his hand up against the window and, um, outside of this window, again, it was Halloween. So everything outside was very Halloweeny, Halloween like. And, um, as soon as he touched the window, it turned into a beautiful, bright day, beautiful day with a rainbow outside. And he turns around and he anoints her head with oil. Okay. Hello. And he turns and he anoints her head with oil. Do you think she sounds like she's like she's somebody going pre-trib? No. This isn't the description of somebody going pre-trib. He's showing her something. I don't believe he's showing her something in this because it it's for her. I believe what he's showing is knowing that it will get related in a in a video for people to come and listen. And I think it's fitting that it we are one of those groups of people that have come to be shared this this video of this dream. And there are others around the world as well. Being anointed with oil has nothing to do about going pre-trib. 
It's an anointing for what? A service to the Lord. And it happens on Halloween. When the white horse rider comes to a group of workers. Sound familiar? Well, what about oil? When is oil harvested and being crushed in Israel to make that fresh golden oil? Well, let's have a look at this. What time of year are olives harvested in Israel? October and November. October and November. Kind of fitting, right? In October through November. Like, it, it literally is on the split of the day that he's coming. October 31st to November 1st. I found that was very interesting as well. The timing of being an anointed with oil. Now, we'll listen to the last little bit, and I found this very interesting as well. Then, um, she said everything in the room began to change from gold to silver to yellow. Um, I know I'm missing something else. Um, oh, yeah. So she has um, in her room, also she has in her room, paper butterflies on the wall. And um, all the paper butterflies begin to fly off of the wall and through. They're just flying in her room. <laughs> I just think this, this room is absolutely fantastic. And I know that this is going to bless you. Um, and um, so just to let you know, this cat does not ever act like this. <laughs> so she must feel the presence of the Lord right now or she is just whatever. Anyway, so then... Um, after all these things happened, after he touched the window, she got anointed, her head got anointed with oil. Um, the butterflies start fl flying off the wall and then the colors begin to change in her room. He proceeds to take her outside, um, into this trail that they have near the house. <clears throat> and, um, they start walking down the trail and he introduced, or he shows, he introduces her, I guess, um, to the disciples. And, um, this, um, so when she, he introduces her to the disciples, um, the Lord says to her, this, you know, he, he named her by name and he said, this is your home. Ah, interesting, right? So then he takes her, they're walking down a trail, like in a forested area, it would seem. He introduces her to the disciples. Now you have to remember, a lot of people will call people disciples, but remember there were the apostles as well. And the apostles are separate from disciples as we know. So I think it's interchangeable that when she was introduced, because what we're seeing here appears to be more of a picture of her being a remnant worker, one of the disciple workers. And she's being introduced to the disciples or probably the apostles, though it's possible she's being introduced to the group of other disciples for which she is rep being represented as a disciple. And he then says, this is your home. Well, they were walking down a trail. They were walking down some trail, wilderness, whatever it was, and going down this path. And he says, this is your home. She doesn't go on to show, you know, here's a picture of her house and it had these numbers and she walked into this big, beautiful house in paradise. No. They were walking down a trail, met the disciples and said, this is your home. Sounds very familiar, doesn't it? I think it does. Because we know that in this time of tribulation that's coming, this remnant group of workers, right? This remnant group, where are we? Even here, this remnant group of Smyrna, which is represented by those disciples, okay? Ephesus, these guys are the apostles that were anointed first. And then when the Lord comes, these are going to be his apostles, and they're going to receive an anointing and probably go and meet where the apostles are. And what ends up happening? They're going to be part of the wanderings. They're not just, go, we're not going to go back to our homes. The work has begun. We're with the Lord for 40 days and then the work has begun. And the work begins when we're with him for 40 days when he comes on the white horse rider. I thought that was really wild. It was in line with what we've understood for years in relation to the end of days and a remnant group that are going to serve the Lord. So I had to share that. I just thought it, it was again. You see, again, 31st, October 31st. Many people have had dreams and visions and have talked about Halloween for many years. But they all think that the connection is the pre-trib. It's not the pre-trib. It's like her dream showed. 
It's his timing of the white horse rider when he will anoint and have a disciple group that will be ready, follow him and serve him. And then we'll meet up with the apostles, probably in some sort of upper room place. You see? And then they go out at the end of their anointing by the Holy Ghost on the 50th day from Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is attacked and destroyed, as you guys have heard many times over the years. So, again, October 31st, but not just somebody thinking rapture October 31st, but the Lord appearing on the white horse rider. That was the key. That was the key. And, of course, the anointing, right? Having the oil put on, I think that was a huge deal as well because that's not a picture of, of people being taken pre-trib. It's a picture of a group to serve the Lord. All right. Now, let's get into this. So this is uh, our brother I was telling you about, uh, Link, oh, not 78, Link 74. And we're not going to go into everything. If you want to see his video, this is his channel right here, Link 74, and it's the Halloween star uh, Arcturus. And I want you to see what he talks about here, and I'm going to show you. I'm going to go read about this as well, where it's found. Actually, it ends up being the same thing. You see, it's right here. This is from uh, Earth Sky. It says, every Halloween, a few days before and after, the brilliant star Arcturus, brightest star in booties, the herdsman, set, uh, uh, da, 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 star in booties, the herdsman, sets at the same time and on the same spot on the western horizon as the summer sun. The star arises at the same time, at the same place, on the eastern horizon as the summer sun. That's why every year at this time, you consider Arcturus as a ghost of the summer sun. What? You see, I've told you guys before, I'm not a big uh, uh, constellations guy. There's certain aspects you know, like of Taurus and things like that, that, I, that I've understood to an extent. But these types of things and all the details of these different stars and their meanings and so forth, I've never really understood them. And so to find something like this, to have a brother share something like this and to go look into it and to see that it's connected to Halloween, you're going to see what it means with Arcturus, that he is a herdsman or represents, the star represents herdsman, what his name means besides herdsman, and that he is a picture of the sun being one of the brightest stars in the sky. In fact, it is the fourth brightest star in the sky. And it rises and sets at the time of Halloween as the summer sun. Wait a second. The summer sun, you'll recall, the summer sun was what? Like right here, wasn't this the summer sun? Right? Isn't this what we were looking at for a year's end? For a connection to these things? Well, what you're going to see is that, remember, the sun is fallen. Christ is, has, has been maybe occasionally... You know, maybe a couple times in Scripture, it seems like there's a reference to him as the S-U-N, S-O-N. But the reality is, the S-U-N has fallen, so how could it be Christ? We know from Genesis 1 that Jesus isn't the Son. We know that he was the light created before the sun and the moon. And we know that the sun and the moon have fallen. So listen, look at what our brother shows. As he explains this, which is the piece I just showed you here, he goes in to Psalms 19. And in Psalms 19, we've shared this many times, and I'm going to read it all today because there's other good details in there as well. But it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament show his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, night unto night showeth knowledge. Okay? Sun, moon, and stars, right? In particular, constellations of stars. 
There is no language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth. Okay, the constellations, the stars. And their words to the end of the world. In them he hath set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoicing as a strong man ready to run a race. Well, you guys know precisely what we associate Psalms 19 with. This, again, is another one of those things where we have shown that Psalms in order, Psalms 19 through 33, right? Or 18 is the seven days, and then 19 through 33 is another thing like John's Gospel of chapters to years. And we've talked on Psalms 19 for years, being the time when the Son of Man comes on the eighth day when he returns from the wedding and begins his 40 days as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, now ready to run a race. Okay? And what do we know about it? His going forth is from one end of heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it. There is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Well, guess what? If Jesus isn't the Son, then what circuit of what constellation? Hello. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Did you see that? Read that word out loud. Say it out loud. Say it five times. And the firmament is what shows his handiwork. His what? His firmament shows his handiwork. What is in the firmament? The ones that declare in utter speech and knowledge. What is no longer in the firmament? The sun and the moon are not in the firmament. They were created in the firmament, right? You guys remember that from Genesis 1? When the sun and the moon were created, they were both lit and they were what? They were in the firmament. You see? And let, their, and let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven to light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also, and God set them in the firmament. Well, what do we know about them now? We know that the sun is off course by two months, two months and change. And we know that the moon is off course every year as well. Coming out early by 10 days or 11 and a quarter days now every year. Because the sun and the moon have fallen, they're no longer in their position in the firmament. So what is uttering speech and knowledge that's in the firmament? It would be the stars. It would be the stars. Their line has gone out through all the throughout all the earth and their words to the end of the world. And then it says, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, ready as a strong man, ready to run a race. His going forth is from one end of heaven and his circuit unto the ends thereof. Remember the circuit? This is that word that we've been talking about a lot over the years and then kind of set it aside. And now it's come back full force again. It's either relating, it tells us, to the circuit of the sun right or it's a circuit of time relating to the year and we talked about the time portion being the pre-trib in the last one right remember that so this is a year's end this is a year's end as a circuit of time it's a year's end for a circuit of time and we've shared on this in this last teaching okay well, I'm going to add to it from something else a brother had posted, but I'm going to wait till we get there to show this connection to the circuit of the end of this harvest season, this, this end of this portion of time. But it's not the circuit of the sun. It's not this circuit. So what on earth can this bridegroom coming out of his chamber, ready as a strong man, ready to run a race, what could his circuit be that's from one end of heaven unto the other? 
Well, if you understand, how could it be the sun? How could it be the sun when the sun has fallen? And of course, the moon, when the moon has fallen. Is there a star that speaks of him? That rises and sets? As the sun? Is that possible? And that circuit is as the sun? You see? What what are we looking at? Right here, right? Everything is connected to the 31st. This is telling us that every Halloween through Arcturus, the brightest star, which is in booties, is the herdsman. And it rises at the same spot or sets at the same spot on the western horizon as the sun and rises at the same time on the eastern horizon as the sun. Is it possible Arcturus through Buddhist, uh, Buddhist and Arcturus being the representation of the herdsman? The brightest star within the herdsman? Is this potentially a connection to Christ? Because if so, guess what it's telling us? It's also telling us October 31st would be the year's end in connection to Psalms 19 that we've been looking for, which isn't related to the circuit of the sun, but a star in the same timing or place and times as the sun, but not the sun but a star related to Christ. Don't you worry. We're going to get into it. We're going to go deeper into it. Let's just read the rest of Psalms 19. Um, Verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping them is a great reward. Servants and rewards. Isn't that exactly what's coming? Isn't that exactly what's coming when he comes as the Son of Man on the white horse rider for 40 days at this time of a type of sun representation through a star in booties called the herdsman with Arcturus? And those servants will receive what? Great reward when it's all over? They're going to rule and reign with them. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me my secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen and amen. Brothers and sisters, this is his coming for 40 days. If his coming for 40 days is at the time of the white horse rider, at the time of Halloween, which begins his 40 days, which is Psalms 19, and the connection to it we find out is Arcturus, which is in booties called the herdsman, and it's at the same spot as the sun, at sunrise and sunset, as the summer sun was at the time of its equinox, then is it possible that the herdsman is a picture of Christ? Well, let's see what it tells us about what we've taught about. Remember the sun and the moon? The sun... Having fallen, the sun is what? Is a picture of Lucifer. And the moon represents whoever the false prophet will be. Who it represented historically at that time, I don't know. 
But we know the sun represented was represented by Lucifer. And, of course, so Lucifer is the beast, is the Antichrist. And he's a picture of the sun that's fallen. And we've got the moon. The moon is a picture of the false prophet. And the moon has also fallen. They've both fallen and gone off course. Well, we see this in Isaiah 14, in verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? And then he goes on to talk about, you know, he wants to exalt, exalt himself, his throne above the stars of God. Because remember, he's also a picture here of the Antichrist, of the beast in the end of days. We know he's going to have the time when he is the beast, then he's killed. He's going to come back at mid-trumpets. And at that point, the temple is rebuilt in the first half of trumpet judgments, right? The second set of seven years in the first half of it. And when it's done, Satan is cast down, the, the, the pit is open, and the beast comes back up. And look at what he comes back up to say. The exact same thing as Lucifer from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Because the beast is Lucifer and he is a picture of a typology of the sun that is fallen. And the beast uh, and the false prophet is the picture of the moon. So they have fallen. You see? Remember this in Isaiah 24. When the Lord comes and he's then on Mount Zion. And we, this is connected most likely even to the end of seals. Listen to what it says. Then the moon shall be confounded and the sun ashamed why would the sun and the moon be confounded and ashamed weren't they great creations by the lord well they were when they were in the firmament but they fell and they've gone off course hence this going off course that revealed to us the true beginning which was in taurus and then listen to what it says when the lord of hosts shall reign in mount zion and jerusalem when is he going to be reigning? When is he going to be in Mount Zion and, and Jerusalem? At the end of seals, right? To start trumpets. And before his ancients gloriously. So, yes, it is at the end of seals, but then we know there's more stuff, which is the trumpet judgments, so it could also or be connected to the end of trumpets as well. But the point is that the moon and the sun are ashamed and confounded. Lucifer, the bright and morning star, is fallen you see so what else do we find out now in relation to to having set aside the sun as the thing being on this circuit and try to understand what this circuit is because let me show you this guys this is it's just so wild because you remember in the last teaching and in many before, actually, right? This observing, and we know this connected to the year's end. This is what got us to the year's end, the, the great eighth day, right? And we know that this word for tekufa, it's either a circuit of the sun, right? Well, we know that Christ isn't really the sun. The sun has fallen, so let us not look to the sun, but look to a star that is represented within a constellation representing him, and let's see if that's true. And the other one is a lapse of time. So over the course of all of these years and of searching these things, when looking at this, we've been looking or I've been looking in relation to its connection either June at the, at the uh, summer solstice, but then we know it's off course, right? So then wherever this year's end would be, we were then looking to a year's end that would connect to here, we were looking to a year's end relating to the circuit of, quote unquote, the sun. But what you're starting to realize in this is that what we're not looking for isn't the circuit of the sun, but that there are two circuits. <clears throat> there are, quote, not two circuits, well, kind of two circuits, but two years end. One of these years ends relates to this end of this harvest season at the time of ingathering. And on the Hebrew calendar, it's this one right here. It's right here, which is in alignment with John chapter 7 to the great eighth day, and then boom, chapter 8 starts. And it starts with a picture of the pre-trib being before the bride, and then him coming as the light to shine his light 
to those who are in darkness. But wait a second. So then we've got a year's end connected to here. And there's a year's end connected to here? It would be impossible if we were talking about that with the sun. But we're just reading about now Arcturus, the brightest star in booties, the herdsman, who is a picture of the sun in the firmament that has never gone off course, rising and setting from one end unto the other. Hello. And this is its course. Psalms 19. This circuit, not of the sun specifically, but this circuit of one in the firmament where the handiwork is shown who represents the bridegroom as a strong man ready to run a race. The only reason it seemed like it was the sun all this time is because of the representation of the word circuit of sun, which is course, but it doesn't have to be the sun because the stars are also running their course. So we would have a year's end here and we would have a year's end here. Funny how that works, right? A year's end from the harvest and a year's end for the circuit of a specific star in a constellation. Let's see how true this is. We've eliminated the understanding of the sun now. We've known that the sun has fallen. So let's see what it tells us about herdsmen. What's the difference between a herdsman or what is a herdsman? A herdsman is, check this out, the owner or keeper of a herd. He is the owner or the keeper of a herd. What's the difference, I thought, between herdsmen and a shepherd? The top three skills of herdsmen include milking, dairy farm, and dairy cattle. So milking, dairy, so it's related to dairy, right? Like milk and so forth, right? Gives them milk, and then the meat will come later. Remember, we, all of that type of stuff, right? So, but what is he? He's the owner. He's the owner. Well, look at, look at this. What is a shepherd? The most important skills for a shepherd are CPR, uh, patience, and surgery. So this one feeds them, if you want to say that, right? Is the owner of them, takes care of them, feeds them. And these guys, the shepherds, are the ones that save them. Protect them, save them. One feeding them. One who's the owner that feeds. The other who is the one who protects and watches over them. Can you say the Lord and the servants? Pretty interesting, right? The Lord and his servants at the time of the eighth day when the Lord comes. And what is he going to do when he comes? He's going to meet with his servants. The apostles, the Luke group, the Smyrna group. And they're going to be what? They're going to be his shepherds. He is the great shepherd or the herdsman. And we are the little shepherds, right? He is the great rock. We are the little rock. He is the great light. We are the little light. Pretty wild, right? I was really surprised that it talked about like dairy. So it's funny how these connections were with dairy. And I thought dairy, that's, you know, interesting connection. You could say, you know, being on milk when they first come in, you know, you don't give them meat right away, right? You hear that in, in, uh, in Bible talk all the time, right? You don't give them the steak. You give them some milk and give them some light stuff to take in first. Well, it turns out that David was told a similar thing. Check this out. David in, um, in uh, Solomon chapter 1, verse 17, starting in verse 14. And David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's Sheep. To feed his father's sheep. Interesting, right? At Bethlehem, and the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. They're going out to battle. David goes to feed the sheep, and it's connected to a period of time of 40 days. 
Funny how that works, right? And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephod of parched corn, which would be of grain, right? Wheat, grain, and these ten loaves. Loaves are the ones that have yeast in them, right? They're the ones that have the leaven in them because they're loaves. And run uh, to the camp of thy brethren. Now listen to this. And carry these ten cheeses. What? <laughs> I saw this and I was like, what? I was thinking about David in another context and I came to read this and I was like, and ten cheeses? What, what do you mean cheeses? Bread, we understand he's bringing them cheeses and bread. Well, pretty interesting now, isn't it? When the herdsman deals with the dairy also? Wild. I thought that was so wild. Well, check it out. What else do we know this period is relating to? Well, it's when he comes on the white horse rider. He's coming on the eighth day after the wedding. He's coming after they have they have uh, uh, settled to to stop the fighting after the first attack. Um, he's coming to meet his disciples, who he's going to anoint, who he's going to have a meal with. Huh? Who he's going to have a meal with? Interesting. Um. Uh, uh, what else? And he's here for 40 days. Well, what do these 40 days relate to? Well, these 40 days relate to the, um, to the birth of Christ, right? They relate to the birth of Christ. So if we go to the story of the birth of Christ in Luke chapter 2, this is going to get wild, guys. In Luke chapter 2, remember, we know Luke in order. Pre eight days, then the 40. Right on the eighth day starts the 40. It's a picture of his birth. But remember those teachings from a while back. They are a picture of his birth. But the real timing of it is about two months later. Because remember, when Jesus was baptized, he began to be about 30. But he didn't go out right away. Remember what happened? He was gone into the wilderness for 40 days. He um, uh, uh, then he gra he gathered disciples and and all of that. And then we know. So it was about two months later before John was taken into prison, something we've taught on many times, which revealed to us that the Lord, if his birthday on the Hebrew calendar, you're going to want to pay attention to this. We're going to get to this on the Hebrew calendar. The third month is Savan. And Jesus was born on the third month, 15th day. Okay? So on the Hebrew calendar, this would be Jesus' birthday. And we talked about this being the connection to in the beginning. Okay? In the beginning. Just like creation. In the beginning. But this was the beginning because we're in Taurus. But if Christ was born on the 15th day of the third month, then in the beginning, Savan Taurus wasn't the 15th day of the third month. It was the first day of the first month. Remember that? Remember we were talking on that? The 15th day of the Hebrew calendar, so in this case of the third month, we showed that in history, as it was in the beginning, the sun and the moon were lit together. He didn't create the moon and it was dark. They were both lit. And what happened is it was in Taurus, which is in the beginning. He's the Alpha, the Omega, right? The Aleph and the top, Taurus. And what did it say about history? That the year began. In Taurus, <clears throat> at the spring equinox. But this year, we showed how this connection, how it was so far off that it was actually happening at the summer solstice. So this, as I've been showing this the past several months, this is as it was in the beginning. Where this year, the first time, and it won't happen for another 30 years, where the sun, moon, and stars were at 
the circuit, if you will, of the sun, or or a a a um the the summer solstice. But historically, this would have happened in the beginning, all the way back in spring. But because the sun and the moon has gone off course, and the Hebrew calendar added an additional month this year, it equaled the summer solstice. So if this was the beginning, and it was the fifteenth day of the third month on the Hebrew calendar. Well, how could this be Jesus's birth when it's supposed to be the 15th day of the third month? This is the first day of the first month as it was in the beginning. So where is the third month, 15th day? Don't worry, we'll get there. <laughs> we're, we're almost there. We're there. We're almost there. Okay. Look what happens in Luke chapter two. So in Luke chapter 2, remember, what are we looking for now? We know that the 30 days of the Son of Man, or the 40 days of the Son of Man, is a picture of the 40 days of his birth, but we know from Isaiah 9 that it doesn't happen on his birth, that it's about two months after when he fulfilled Isaiah 9 when uh, uh, in relation to the prophetic, which shows that the, the typology of um, the two that two cities that represent Haifa and Tel Aviv in the typology to when the Lord then comes on the eighth day. And when he comes on the eighth day, it's got to be about two months from where his birthday would be as it was in the beginning. Okay? That's why I said, anybody that's new, this might be a little trickier to follow, but if you've been around for a bit, you will get what I'm talking about. So, what were we looking at? It's supposed to be as the, the shepherds, right? So if he's the herdsman, and the herdsman is booties, and the brightest star in it is Arcturus, and he's coming for the 40 days for the shepherds because the shepherds are going to be the ones, his servants, the, the Smyrna group, the Luke 24 group, this group being prepared, from, from taken from among the bride. The bride is going to go, and this group is going to remain. This is the group that when he comes for 40 days are his shepherds who are going to save his people working during the time of seals. So look at what it says in Luke chapter 2. In verse 7, And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothing and laid him in the manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And listen to this. And there were in the same country shepherds shepherds abiding in the field keeping watch over their flock by night when the son of man comes at the time of his birth but we know is two months later based on isaiah to matthew which we'll talk about in a moment we know he's coming to his shepherds who are going to be the ones keeping watch over his flock. So the, who's the son represented as here? The son is a clear picture here of the herdsman. The herdsman who is the owner. Interesting how that happens, right? Now watch this in relation to the calendar being off. Watch this. Okay? This is where, right here, okay? From the 31st of October to November 1st should be the timing of the Son of Man coming as the white horse rider for 40 days, which should be a picture of what we've been showing for a long time relating to him coming about two months after his birth. Okay? Again, we've shared on this. So let me show you what it was in the past to refresh some of your memories. If this... The 15th day of the third month, like Isaac, right in the Apocrypha, it tells us Isaac was born on the 15th day of the third month. He's a picture of Christ. Judah is also a picture of Christ. He was born on the 15th day of the third month. Well, in the Hebrew calendar, here's the 15th day of the third month. But what do we know? We know that the, that the calendars are off by two months. So if we don't account for the calendars being off, then we say what? Here's Jesus' birth, and about two months later, Jesus comes 
on the eighth day, remember if this was going to be the pre-trib? Remember that? There's the pre-trib. The pre-trib happens. There's your seven days and the eighth day. Jesus comes on the eighth day about two months after his birth. But you know what we did in all of it? We were still counting it from the Hebrew calendar. We were still counting it from the Hebrew calendar. And for those that don't know what I'm talking about, okay? We know and have proven, and many others have, through the sun, moon, and stars. We've done it through history as well. Jesus was born on the third month, 15th day. But this is the Hebrew calendar, third month, 15th day. When we added the two months later for the Lord to come on the eighth day to begin his 40 days, we did it not based on him coming two months later because of the, the sun being off course. We did it because of what we know from Isaiah chapter 9 and Matthew 4. There's the light affliction on Zebulun and Naphtali. This is the first attack that's going to come at the pre-trib gone and the first attack that's going to come on Haifa and Tel Aviv and begin the 50 days. And then what happens? Then it settles, just like the guy said, just like their plan was. It's going to settle, and on the eighth day, here comes the Son of Man. The people that walked in darkness saw great light. And then what happens? Well, if you go to Matthew chapter 4, you find out when Jesus fulfilled this in the is, to understand the prophetic picture of the is to come, listen to what it said. This is where Jesus fulfilled it in the is, but it's also prophetic for the is to come. It says, now, when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee and having uh, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is on the, upon the seacoast, in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by way of the sea, beyond the, Gen uh, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which were that sat in darkness saw a great light. This was him fulfilling the prophecy from the was into the is. And what did it say in Isaiah chapter 9? It says that they saw a great light, right? So he fulfilled it. But what did Isaiah 9 start with? That there was an attack on those two northern cities. And then when it says he came, he was the one and shed the light in the darkness, it said, for unto us a child is born. Well, clearly, this didn't happen at Jesus' birthday. It happened about two months later. And we know this because it starts by saying, now Jesus heard that John was in prison. But obviously, he wasn't in prison at the time of Jesus' birth because in Luke chapter 3, John the Baptist baptizes him. It says it was, a, it was a, about Jesus' 30th birthday. And then you have 40 days in the wilderness. And then you have him gathering disciples and people. And then they're baptizing in, in one of the, the rivers. While John is in another place baptizing people. So John still wasn't yet cast, cast into prison, which wasn't for about two months. So... What does that mean in relation to what we had done? I was going off a Hebrew calendar and accounting for the two months of Isaiah 9 to when he really fulfilled it at the time John was in prison, which was about two months later. But I started my count on a Hebrew calendar and I ended it two months later in a Hebrew calendar. But guess what? Guess what? This was in the beginning. Taurus, sun, moon, both lit. History told us that Taurus at the equinox, which this year is in the solstice, was the beginning of the year, which means this would be day one. And do you know what happens when this is day one? Let me just use the Hebrew calendar. There's... Month two. There's month three. 
And that would mean right around here, this would be Jesus' birthday on a true beginning Taurus calendar, as it was in the beginning, of, on the Hebrew calendar, would be the third month. But remember, our months are going from full moon to full moon. Whoa. Full moon to full moon? Based on creation. We've shared on this before. I'm going to show you the imagery of this. Okay? So this would make this what? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Okay? You can say right in here. Jesus, at the time of his birth. Third month, 15th day. From a Taurus count as it was in the beginning. Sun bright, moon bright. So if this was Jesus' birth, what would be two months later? One. Two. What? What? Did you catch that? Did you catch that? What I had shared, what we'd been sharing for a long time and watching for, was from Jesus' birth, but knowing, not because of two months off, but knowing that he fulfilled Isaiah, which is prophetic for the timing of the end of days in Isaiah 9, he fulfilled it about two months later because John was in prison, and we were looking for this time when the Lord would then come back about what? Two months. Two months. Whoops. Two months. One. Right? There's one month. There's two months. So in a Hebrew calendar count from his birthday, two months later, would put it right here. And that's why we were looking right here from the ninth of Av, which is the time of the first attack, right? We know this from Scripture. And then what? Then you have the 50-day count, which brings you to the year's end, and then the attack that happened at the time of trumpets, 50 days in between. But you know what we just did? We just said, hold on a second. This was the beginning of creation. This began their year thousands of years ago. The sun with the sun in the constellation of Taurus and the moon lit as it was in the beginning. This began the year. So if this began the year, then this is month one, day one. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Here's our chart that we did again, okay? This is the, the MR chart with Taurus. So here, the red is the Hebrew calendar. The blue days are the ministry revealed Taurus count calendar. And then, of course, the black is the Gregorian calendar. So here we are. Savan 15, Hebrew calendar, June 21st, month one, day one. So we keep going. There's day two on July 21st, day two, month one, and look, 15th of Tammuz, start of second month, right? With a Taurus beginning count. Let's go to month three. Month three, day one, 15th of Hebrew calendar of Av. And what are we looking for now? Third month, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Uh, sorry, sorry, 15. So what do we have? Third month, 15th day for the birth of Christ, as this is on the Hebrew calendar, on the correction for a Taurus beginning, full moon, full sun, in Taurus, this is the adjusted two months, and there is now month three, and here is the 15th day of the third month. Okay, puts us at September 2nd. So if we go to September 2nd, okay, again, September 2nd, you can say even into the uh, third. And the reason I say this is you're going to notice we've even shown this over the years in the Hebrew calendar that the Hebrew calendar, um, when a month starts, sometimes it's off or too early by one by one day. Remember that? In fact, I think this was one of those days where where they had it over here and it was actually a day earlier. So they have the first of Elul here. 
But when we went and checked with the moon, obviously it was over here. So now what happens? This is the true timing as it was in the beginning, okay? Remember, if we're doing this because God is going to reestablish his season and time, he's going to correct the calendars when all of this begins, then this would be the third month, 15th day. Third month, 15th day. So now, if we account for Isaiah, and we know that it didn't happen at his birthday, but that it was two months after his birthday that represent the start of the 40 days, then let's go, there's month four, there's month five, and where's the 15th day? Boom, right here, October 31st. So what would be the beginning of his 40 days? Right here to right here, October 31st to November 1st. It's the exact same count that we did earlier from June to August that we've been looking at for over a year. But when I did that, I did it not expecting that the count would continue to be on a God count from Taurus and would continue all of the months going forward two months off. But when he did, when it does continue, when it does continue going two months off, we end up with the pre-trib ending as John 7 into 8 from the end of the eighth day to the pre-trib and the beginning of the seven days to which the eighth day on a continued two month off calendar being the literal date of two months after his birthday. It is the exact same thing that we talked about and been seeking and searching and understanding and waiting a whole year to get to in a June count to August. In a June count to August, we continued on it. When we followed the two months and said, well, okay, what if God continues to correct that calendar and then it remains everything two months difference to account for Taurus being the beginning? Then the two months from his birthday from a true August month one equals two months later from his birthday, October 31st to November 30th, just like Isaiah 9 and would be the beginning of his 40 days as Luke chapter 2 when the shepherds were there. The shepherds were there keeping their watch and here comes the herdsmen. Did you track that? Watch it again if you need to. Watch it again if you need to. So what ends up happening? Well, this is day one, right? So we've got them all in yellow. So these are the 50 days. Now remember, it can go evening to evening, right? Remember what we were saying earlier. So this is day one of 40, right? So now the Lord's 40 days have begun. His 40 days will continue until, I think it's right here, something like that. I think it's December 10th. His 40 days are over. And then what do you have? One, two, three, to the end of 50 days and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And remember what I said. It can be off by about a day on the circuit of the sun because of how the, the months are counted with the moon. And where do we end our 50 days? Right here. What is this to this? That would be the true Feast of Trumpets. That would be the true Feast of Trumpets. In a, in a Lord God established from a full moon beginning in Taurus, with the sun in Taurus, and the full moon as the start of the month. It equals exactly, exactly. This might be the proof, and it might be sad to say, I mean, or difficult to say or understand, but this, if it happens, if we've understood this, then this would be the evidence 
that the start of the month is the full moon. That's a hard pill to swallow after all these years. I know there's a brother uh, out eastern Ontario. I'm western Canada. He's out east in Ontario, Canada. And he's been tracking this for like 20 years with people from all over the world. Telling everybody, no, it's, it's from the full moon. I've, I've looked at all sorts of things and I just couldn't accept it. I'm still not saying absolutely it is. But if we've understood, and this stuff all begins from, from, uh, from uh, what is it? From the eighth day, and this begins the 14 years, I mean the, the 50 days, the pre-trib escape and the attack, then it will be that the full moon is the beginning of the month. And it makes so much sense when we understand that this year the sun was in Taurus and at the time of the full moon, which was the equivalent this year at the solstice as it was thousands of years ago in the equinox in spring. It's what started the year. It just so happens with the, the sun having gone off course and with the additional month on the Hebrew calendar, this year, over the next 30 years, is the only time all three of them land in place together. This might be the evidence. This is one clue to the evidence that the full moon may be the beginning of the month. And in this calculation of it, it brings us to Month two, it brings us to month three, and it brings us to 15 more days to the third month, 15th day, which would be as it was in the very beginning, equivalent to Jesus' birthday, third month, 15th day, which would be then one, two months later, and literally equal exactly what we've been looking for for over a year. But with this time showing this calendar, which was done by our brother Robert in, uh, in, in British Columbia, Canada, like four years ago for me. Was it possible? I just never thought it was possible that the Lord would continue to keep everything two months off. And do you understand why this is so wild? Because it starts everything. On the last day of the feast or the end of the feast and the new beginning. Right here. At the pre-trip. Which is connected to John 7 into 8. Which has, which has Exodus 34, 19, when it would be observed. It actually lands it and then lands all the rest perfectly right here with the white horse rider as the Son of Man coming, equaling two months calendar adjustment and from his true birthday, from a Taurus count, equaling the two, mount, the two months difference from Isaiah 9 and revealed in Matthew 4, showing that it was when John was then put in prison that Jesus comes walking through the two cities that had been devastated in the first attack, and the Son of Man comes to shine his light in the darkness. You don't think that makes sense? Watch what happens next. Actually, I'm going to finish that other thought. Because watch what happens. Right here. What in relation to Zechariah chapter 7. Remember in Zechariah chapter 7, in fact, our brother Ivan from South Africa made a, a comment recently that was interesting. In relation, and another brother had observed it too. In relation to what this says. In Zechariah chapter 7, another chapter to year gospel, uh, a book, because it has 14 chapters, it starts with 70 years, 
and seven chapters later, which is a picture of seven years, the seventh year of seals, he then says in verse 5, Speak unto all the people of the land and to the priests, saying, When you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, even those, past tense, 70 years, did you at all fast unto me, even to me? Everything is past tense. Fasted, mourned, those. Okay? It's all back for when you did those things for 70 years. It says, when Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity, when the cities thereof round about her, when men inhabited the south of the plain, everything is past tense that they did for 70 years. And in those 70 years, they observed the fasting in the morning of the fifth and seventh month. Well, that fasting and morning of the fifth and the seventh month, the fifth month is this one right here, the ninth of Av. Well, that would mean that in the 70 years, they would need, so if we're in the 70th year, they would have to have had to have observed the fasting in the morning of the ninth of Av in the 70th year. So what did that mean? That actually is the clue that tells us it couldn't have been this as the start because they have to observe it. But then what happens? Well, if everything happened a little bit later, like we were suspecting, maybe this difference here in September, well, then they wouldn't have had the chance to observe the fasting in the morning of the seventh month. And the fasting of the morning of the seventh month is from an attack that happened on the Feast of Trumpets 50 days later from the one on the 9th of Av, but they observe it on the 3rd of Tishri. So if the end of the 50 days was really going to end up here, then how would they have observed this unless we say, well, they observed it the year before because this is when the 70 years started, last year. Well, now we're understanding that the Lord God isn't counting his years from the Hebrew calendar because we all know that it's off. And if everything is off by that difference of the two months, well, then guess what happened? They've already observed the ninth of all fasting and morning of the fifth month in the 70th year, which means they're still going to have to observe the fasting in the morning of the seventh month in the 70th year. Which means there's no attack coming. There's no pre-trib that can happen until some point after the 3rd of Tishri where they will have observed the fasting in the morning of the 7th month in the 70th year. Pretty wild, right? Where does that put us? In some sort of connection where now we know that the 50 days would begin here especially when you tie in the last teaching and you track all this, watch it again, seek it out. And when you count all this out and you get to the end of the 50 days and the next coming attack, it turns out it's where the Lord God's true Feast of Trumpets is and would be the beginning of the 14 years at the end of the 50 days. Doesn't seem to make any sense until you what? Until you track the two months off. And you continue to track the two months off. You see what happens? Look at this. Here's the, here's the Hebrew calendar in the, in the gold, in the yellow, okay? Month one, Passover, Nisan, okay? Jews feasts, Hebrew calendar, okay? Their calendar month names, the, 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 the constellations, and then the Gregorian calendar months. God's feasts, okay, on the corrected Hebrew calendar beginning from Taurus, here's where the Hebrews month one is, here's where the Lord God's month one is, okay? Month one, it says Nisan here, but it's only so you can associate what the Jews call month one. But to the Lord God, he would call it month one. It starts in Taurus. When it starts in Taurus, it's in May or June. But remember, we're going from the full moon as the start of the month, so it would rarely be in May, and it will mostly be in June, okay? So there's your month one, month two, month three. Month three, well, Jesus was born in the third month, 
on the 15th day. Right? Third month, 15th day. Well, to the Jews, look at what it is. Within that time, you have the ninth of Av. So to the Jews, right here, the ninth of Av is that fasting and mourning. And there's your 15th day, third month. To the Jews, Av is the fifth month. This 15th day would be um, the start of the month. You know, I said it was Jesus' birthday, but the start of the month, and it would have Jesus' birthday din down here. If the calendar is from Dark Moon, then this would be Jesus' birthday. But if that were the case, then everything goes up by two weeks, which means Jesus would be coming right here to start his 40 days. That doesn't correlate, correlate with Scripture. That doesn't line up at all. This is why I'm saying I believe we're being we're proving here. We're showing out the evidence of the full moon being the start of the year, uh, the start of a month. So here's Jesus's birthday. And where are we? We're in the Hebrew third uh, fifth month. Which would be. The Hebrew fifth month on God's calendar is the third month. So then what do they do? They've observed the fasting in the morning of the ninth month. That's already passed. Then it was Jesus' birthday in the third month. But we know from that, from Isaiah 9 to Matthew, that there was two months difference in between. And so what's going to happen? In the seventh month, they're going to observe Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, which on the third day is when they observe the fasting in the morning of the seventh month. And then the real ninth of Av isn't from Dark Moon, it's from full moon. So what do we end up with? Right? There's your beginning of the month. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This would be the eighth day of the fifth month. You see that? On the Hebrew calendar, it would be the seventh month. On a Taurus beginning year, it would be the fifth month. So we go to the fifth month or Hebrew calendar seventh month and we don't start from dark moon. We start from full moon. And when we start from full moon, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's the eighth day of the month and that would be the ninth day of the month. Well, guess what? What were we looking for back here? From the eighth day of the, of the fifth month, and then the ninth day is the ninth of off. What we were looking for for the beginning of the 50 days, the pre-trib in the beginning of the 50 days. In the adjusted calendar, with the moon adjustment, we end up, this is the start of the fifth month, not the seventh, but to the Lord God, the fifth month. This is the eighth day of the fifth month. That makes this the ninth day of the fifth month to the Lord God. And what is it? To him, it's the ninth of off. It's the ninth of Av. And what were we looking for? We've been looking for this connection where they observe the fifth and the seventh month for 70 years in their calendar. But to the Lord God, on his calendar, after they've observed it, to the time of the year's end, we end up from the ninth of the fifth month, the true ninth of the fifth month, that then brings us to 50 days, and brings us to the end of 50 days, which will bring us to the Lord God's true beginning of what? Ninth month? No. Nope. Seventh month. Because everything's off by two months. Which means there's the seventh month, and what do they call it? Kislev. November, December. From a full moon, it's mostly in December. So they call it Kislev, but the Lord God would call it, not Kislev, but the seventh month because it's two months off. Everything in a way I've never ever seen or grasped or comprehended before, it's falling in its place. Even in relation to this mystery of how October 31st into November 1st can be the Son of Man as the white horse rider connected to a period of a true two months after his birth where there's no way 
you can account for that because it would be now like four months or three and a half or four and a half months. The only way this is accounted for is in understanding that it's two months off and that it goes full moon to start the month. I didn't figure this out ahead of time. We've already seen and brought this about through scripture to show this timing and the connection. And then in deeper digging, because of this booties with Arcturus, it revealed this understanding. And as I continued to dig deeper and deeper into it, I said, wait a second. Hold your horses. If, if this is the beginning of the year, well, it's not Jesus' birthday because it's month one, day one. And if it's month one, day one, Jesus wasn't born on month one, day one. Jesus was born on month three, day 15. So back to our, our calendar that we did. Go oh, month one, day one, and go to month three, day 15. I said, wait a second then this is the real representation as it was in the beginning to show Jesus' true birth. And then it dawned on me, if, what about, you know, he, he didn't fulfill those things of Isaiah 9 from the was and the is until John was in prison, which is about two months later. So for him to come two months later would be one, two. And I thought, oh my goodness. It is the exact same count that we had done. All we are doing in this is adjusting by continuing the two months off and starting the months from a full moon. I did not go to that first. I want you to understand it. It was the revelation of Scripture that showed us the year's end being this new beginning. What happens at this point? Do you know that what happens? Remember, because it would have to be what? The eighth day into the ninth day, and not the seventh month, but the fifth month. So it ends up being the fifth and the seventh month, the 50 days in between from attack one to attack two on God's calendar by adjusting two months difference. It's exactly what it's got. And we're told everywhere in Scripture that the Jews have erred. So is it possible that it goes from full moon? Well, there's a brother out there that's been committed for 20 years, showing it over and over with people all around the world. Maybe he's got it. It seems to be valid according to all of these revelations that we've understood. But what is this period of time that starts it all? It's the year's end, right? What do they call it? Shmini Aretz and Shimchat Torah. This is the time. They're connected together. So at the time of the year's end, then it all begins into Simchat Torah. Okay? Let's have a look at this. Check this out. Here is Simchat Torah. Okay? Listen to what it's about. It says, is a celebration marking the conclusion of an annual cycle of public Torah readings, the end and the beginning of a new cycle. Hello. The end of a cycle, the beginning of a cycle. Isn't that something we were looking for? Simchat Torah is a component of the biblical Jewish holiday of Shemini Aretz, the eighth day of assembly, which follows immediately after the fall of, Suk of Sukkot in the seventh month. Okay? Now watch what happens. Listen to what they study. This was shared in the forum as well. In these Torah readings that they do, on Simchat Torah, the seventh one, this final one in relation to the seven, is Genesis chapter 1, 1 through 2. Oh, sorry, chapter 1, verse 1 through 2 and 3. Do you know why? Because it said it's the end of their Torah readings and the beginning of a new cycle. Do you know why that's fascinating? Because this right here, is what we were talking about, the end of a cycle 
and the beginning of a cycle. Who is this? Who's related to the beginning of this cycle? Who does it relate to, brothers and sisters? Well, what if we go to Genesis chapter 1? Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and 2 is called what? In the beginning, hello, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. This, through many theologians and historians, they call this the gap theory. That there was some sort of creation that happened here before this. Well, they're right. This is the spirit creation. This is the portion that belongs to the spirit. The beginning is Christ. God is the Father. In Christ, in the beginning. Jesus called the beginning in the end. In the beginning, in Christ. God the Father created heaven and earth. That's exactly what the New Testament tells us. And who is here also? The Spirit of God that moved upon the waters. So you have the Son, the Father, and the Spirit. This is the creation of what we call the Spirit group. Those who are in Christ, Spirit-filled. It's a picture of Luke's portion. And then what do we see? Verse 3, Jesus is then made light. This light is Christ. Jesus is the light. God the Father made Christ the light. This is the portion that this spirit-filled group, they are the ones going pre-trib. In the beginning, they are the pre-trib Luke group, those who are in Christ, spirit-filled. And from among this in Christ, spirit-filled group, there is a remnant that will remain as the shepherds in the field to serve the Lord when he returns for 40 days. And when he comes, he is the light coming to shine in the darkness after that attack on Haifa and Tel Aviv. It is the picture of him coming to begin his 40 days. What was Simchat Torah? The end of the readings and the restarting of it all on the date on the date of the understood pre-trib and beginning of it all. That's wild. We'll go into that some more. But let me bring some more things to connect to this in relation to Arcturus. Check this out. This is in relation to what we're told in Job 38, 31 through 32. It says, Can... Canst thou bind the sweet influences of Pleiades, okay? Star constellation in Taurus. Or loose the bands of Orion. Can, canst thou bring forth the Maseroth in his season? Listen to this. Or canst thou guide Arcturus and his sons? What? What? This is a cluster in a constellation. This is a constellation. This is a single star in a constellation. And it's right there in Scripture. And we're told this star has his sons with him. Has his sons with him. You can go read this coldcasechristianity.com and you can see it uh, from Book of Job and it goes into the context of understanding what scripture tells us about the Pleiades and Orion and being able to show this all out in the constellations but listen to this in the last portion here it's about Arcturus where God describes Arcturus one of the brightest stars in the night sky and challenged Job to guide Arcturus and his sons it turns out that, that what they couldn't see back then what we can discuss, what has been discovered, I think in 71, it says that the sons of Arcturus were another uh, 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 grouping of stars around uh, uh, Arcturus that follow it. 
the sons of Arcturus. Well, listen to how he ends this. Therefore, and it's about their speed and how they move and nothing can hold them back. Therefore, combined attraction of all the stars we know cannot stop him or even turn him in his path. Listen to this. Arcturus and his sons are on a course all their own. Only God has the power to guide them, just as he described in the book of Job. Arcturus, the only singular star named in a constellation called the sheep, the, the, the herdsman, who has sons with him. And nobody could stop them. They are on their own course, guided by the power of God. Can you say Genesis? Can you say Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and 2? Christ, who is the beginning, who in the spirit of creation, it is those who are of the spirit of God, those who are of the Spirit of God, they all go pre-trib, who are in Christ's Spirit-filled, and a remnant from among them remain, who are called what? Who are those with the Spirit of God? They are called the sons of God. The sons of God. Let's see if we can understand who these guys are a little bit better. We've shared on this many, many times over the years, right? In Romans chapter 8, an incredible, incredible chapter. I won't read all of it. Let's start in verse 1. Romans 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And it's all that same kind of conversation in here until we get down. Let's go down to verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, for as many who are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And they're all going pre-trib, except for a remnant chosen to remain as shepherds for the Lord to bring in the great multitude. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself bears witness, witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be glorified also also glorified together. You know who these people are. It turns out Job is telling us that there's a connection to Arcturus as a picture of the son, Jesus, S-O-N, who is with his sons, the remnant workers. And who are these people? What is their reward? Remember, we were talking about their reward as well. And how are they going to be glorified together with Christ? Well, Christ was glorified in his resurrection. Those who will be glorified as Christ was, who will be glorified together with them because they are co-heirs, joint heirs with them, are those, as you know, who put their necks on the line, who will be beheaded in the time of seals, who will have served Christ during seals, as we called the Elijah company. There's a Moses portion and there's an Elijah portion, right? More so maybe the Moses portion with their heads being on the line. But there's the Moses and the Elijah company. And what does it say? But the rest of the dead live not again till the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So who takes place? Who takes part in that first resurrection? Those who served the Lord those who will be co-heirs and rewarded to serve with him in his millennial reign. They're taking place, they're taking part in the first resurrection and everybody else will not take part in it. it. Theirs will come at the end of the millennial reign. And it says, blessed and holy is he 
that has part in the first resurrection, on such the second death has no power. We know who has no power of the second death, right? But they shall be priests of God and unto Christ and shall reign with them a thousand years. A thousand years they're going to reign with them. And they won't be hurt by the second death. You guys all know who that is. It's the Smyrna group of workers. It's a picture. Smyrna is the picture of when the Lord returns after the wedding to begin his 40 days. He's called the first and last, right? The beginning and the end. And what happens? Some of you will be cast into prison. Some of you will be put to death. But what does it say? He that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. This is that remnant group, the sons of God. Those who were held back to serve the Lord, prepared to bring in his people, his shepherds, when he comes as the herdsman. This is the same group that we see from Luke chapter 12, when he says right before the pre-trip, be girded about and your lights burning, waiting for your Lord when he will return from the wedding. That when he returns from the wedding and knocks, he's going to sit and have a meal with them, right? He's going to come and he's going to serve them. The exact same thing we read from Luke 14. We know first he's taking the pre-trib group, the sons and daughters of God, and they're going to the wedding. And then he's going to return from the wedding and he's going to have that banquet meal with them. And when he has that banquet meal, he's going to open to them their understanding and their recompense for their service will be the resurrection of the just. This is the group that we read about in, again, in Revelation chapter 3. They're the beginning of it right before the pre-trib and they're the end of it when they're resurrected. He says in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand in the door and at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come unto him and sup with him and he with me. This is him. Just like Luke chapter 12 when he says, Be ready and I'm coming and knocking when I return from the wedding. This is the very beginning of the end of days when it will be made known to this remnant group. They will be told shortly. I don't know if it's a couple days or if it's a couple minutes before the pre-trib happens, but they're going to be told to be ready when he returns from the wedding, that they're going to be remaining to serve him. This is that moment before everything begins. And this, in verse 21, is when it's all over, when the seven churches have played over again, because this group right here, it's the Smyrna group. It's when he lets them know when he's returning from the wedding to he's going to knock and be ready. And then this is them at the end when they will take part in the resurrection of the just and reign with him for a thousand years. Where it says to him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame. So what? They overcame as Christ overcame because they're going to be serving him for his people during the time of seals and they're going to be having his light. They're going to be the little sheep, the little rocks. And so they're going to sit with him in his throne as he overcame and is sat down with his father in his throne. Who are these people, brothers and sisters? It's the same group. It's connected to Arcturus that only God has the power to drive and it's Arcturus and his sons. The sons of God. The sons of God who are the ones who have the spirit of God. They are the sons of God. So the connection is Arcturus. And, and what do we know when he comes? Well, in the connection that we've just shown, there's the pre-trib. He knocks on the door to let them know, or, or sorry, he comes to let them know right before the pre-trib. Then the pre-trib happens, the wedding's taking place, the attack on Israel, it settles after the Middle East War, brief war. Then the Son of Man comes to begin his 40 days on the date of the white horse rider at Halloween on a count that is exactly the two months count on a Taurus uh, calendar equaling two months from his true birthday on a Taurus calendar equaling October 31st where they will have observed in their calendar, the fifth and seventh month, 
those 70 years because the truth is in a Taurus calendar as it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end. He will reset and begin it at its proper times and it equals the exact same time. And when is October 31st when this happens? It's connected to Arcturus. And Arcturus is this sun, the, uh, sorry, is this star that is setting and rising at the time of Halloween where the sun would rise and set in its exact positions because it's the one that is not corrupted. It's the one in its place. So when the Son of Man comes to fulfill the is to come of the was of Isaiah 9, to walk and to shed his light in the darkness after the affliction of Haifa and Tel Aviv, and he's coming at a time for unto us a child is born, we know isn't going to be exactly at his birthday, but it's two months after, then when he does this, he is shining his light in the darkness. And when he does that, when is it? Well, according to John, which has the chapters to years, we see from the last teaching, the pre-trip, the wedding typology taking place, the stones throw happening. And then here he comes as the son of man in verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall be the light of life. And how did John chapter 7 in, in, in uh, uh, chapters to years in order, it was the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles, to which he then said the last great day of the feast, which is the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles, John 7, to the great eighth day of the feast. And when it was over, they go to their own home, and we go to chapter 8. And when we go to chapter 8, we see that before we go to chapter 8, we see that it was about a prophecy of a prophet not being from Galilee, for there is no prophet from Galilee, but we know there is because Christ, as it says, where is he going to go? Is he going to go to the Gentiles? What's he going to do? Is he going to go to <clears throat> to preach to the Gentiles? Right? You're not going to go to the Gentiles. There, there's no, there's no, um, there's no prophet from Galilee, but we know there is. The prophet from Galilee is when the Son of Man comes as Jonah did. Jonah was a prophet from Galilee. And here he is, after he takes the wedding, the wedding group's gone, he returns on the eighth day as the light shining in darkness. Exactly after, bang. Tabernacles on the Jews feast of tabernacles to the great eighth day to him taking the pre-trib and the wedding beginning in John chapter 8 to him coming at the end of the seven day wedding as the light to shine in the darkness as Isaiah 9 said after the light affliction in the typology of Haifa and Tel Aviv when he will come and shine his light on the darkness connected to his birthday but revealed in Matthew chapter 4 as being once John was in prison, proving that it was two months later, and in a Taurus calendar count, it was exactly two months later. October 31st. Wild, wild, wild connections. Now, what else can we know about Arcturus? I think this was so incredibly telling. I mean, I haven't spent much time in Job. There's been a little bit here and there over the years. But, I mean, this is a star cluster. This is a constellation. This is a star in a constellation. And that constellation, we're told, is connected with this star, Arcturus, being the brightest in it, to the timing of Halloween as the sun coming up in its same places as the sun, but it, we know it can't be the sun because the sun has gone off course and it represents Lucifer, which means is the connection to Christ, the herdsman, through Arcturus, the brightest star in booties? Well, where do we know Christ comes from, brothers and sisters? 
let me give you a let me give you a little glimpse of a reminder. Remember this? In Second Ezra's, I think it's chapter 13, right? One of the apocryphas. We've confirmed all this through we we revealed in scripture, and then this apocrypha was revealed to us. We see this is the pre-trib. We talked about it earlier. Bewilderment of mind. Then they plan to make war against each other, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. This is when World War III will start with the attack on Jerusalem. And then it says, and when these things come to pass and the signs which I showed you, which all the other things that he talked about earlier, he says, then my son will be revealed whom you saw as a man coming up from the sea. And they're all going to leave the warfare against one another and come and desiring to conquer him, even though they're going to be terrified. And it says, but he shall stand on top of Mount Zion. And Zion will be made, Zion will come to be made manifest, a place prepared and built, as you saw, a mountain carved without hands. This is when he comes. This is when he comes at the end of the sixth year of seals on Mount Zion, which is paradise. Where do we know now that this comes from? And this is as I'm winding this down and we'll save the bulk of this that we touched on a couple or so months ago in relation to what it's going to look like. And then we're going to assess in the next teaching whether there's something we can understand that might come before or is everything related to after this time. So he's coming on heavenly Mount Zion. He's coming with paradise. You know, if you go back, you can read all about it. Uh, as you saw coming out of the sea, the region, listen to this. And I tried to see the region or place from which the mountain was carved, but I could not. He couldn't see where this mountain was coming from that was carved without hand. What do we know about this mountain? We know it is heavenly Mount Zion. Where is it coming from? Well, you guys will remember the Lord comes from the north, doesn't he? Remember that? Mount Zion is in the north, probably the North Pole. So remember, this star, Arcturus, it's not Christ. It is a depiction of events. It is a depiction of Christ in the constellation of booties that represents the herdsman. And that constellation is also a typology of Christ. So it's not that it is him. It's a picture of the story being given to us in the heavens. And so when we read this in Psalms 48, where is Mount Zion? Listen to this. We shared this in that teaching a few months ago. Psalms 48. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north. On the sides of the north the city of the great king. We see this even in here. It talks about that my son, uh, it says who he had prepared, who had, re where is it? Right? Uh, the region of the place. He talks about the one who came up from the sea, his son that he has kept for this season. And he is in the north. And he is in the north where Mount Zion is, which is paradise, the mountain carved without hand. And he's coming up from the sea, which you guys know the understanding now if you've been around for that time. We know what this is talking about now. We have an idea of what this craziness is going to look like at the end of the sixth year of seals and what it means to the Elijah company that are alive. Right? We've talked about it. And we're going to go deeper in depth in the next teaching on this. But I wanted you to see, to remind you guys, that if Jesus is the Arcturus star in the representation of booties as him being the herdsman, who is the owner of the sheep, who is a type of star who is greater than the sun, when you go and see, when you read, uh, Arcturus and its brightness and how it's so much bigger than the sun rising and setting at the time of Halloween when we were looking for an understanding of Psalms 19 when there would be the bridegroom coming at the timing of the circuit 
That's from one end unto the other. It's literally what is happening on this date right here with Arcturus, the star, in booties. But where is the sun coming from? Well, if paradise is in the north, is it possible that where Christ is coming from when he comes is going to have a relation to the north when he comes as the white horse rider? Well, check out Arcturus. The star Arcturus. It is the fourth brightest star in the night sky. Listen to this. And the brightest star in the northern celestial hemisphere. It is the brightest star in the northern hemisphere. And coincidentally, Mount Zion is in the sides of the north where the brightest star, Arcturus, in booties, who is the, the herdsman, is. And at the end of seals, when the Lord returns on heavenly Mount Zion, with Mount Zion, with the mountain carved without hand coming up from the sea, it's from the north. You seeing the connection? Here's booties, brothers and sisters. Okay? It's depicted as a man with a sickle, I think, and a spear, a staff. Some have it as a staff. Some have it as a spear. And he has a sickle in his hand. And I think this is Arcturus right here, maybe one of these two here. <clears throat> now, watch this. Listen to what else he's called. The Heavenly Harvester. Booties is associated with the zodiacal constellation Virgo. Virgo, why? It, it's north of Virgo, right? It's above Virgo at about the place of the feet. Well, if you remember the timing of this right here, right? In this period, the sun is still in Virgo at about the knee. And at this point, it's at the time below the feet. What else is below the feet? Arcturus. Booty specifically, but Arcturus. Which tells of the promised seed of uh of the promised seed of woman for Jesus. The other constellations associated with Virgo show a picture of Jesus as a child, the uh Coma Verenes, whatever that one is, and as the despised sacrifice in Taurus. But Booty speaks of Christ returning in power as ruler. That's interesting, right? Because you know what I've been sharing isn't about him coming back as Arcturus, the ruler. I've been talking about him coming as the son of man, as the prophet as Jonah was. But what you come to see is that there's also greater definition within this that seems to tell us it's connected to the time frame of the end of seals. So do you see why I was sharing what I was sharing? When he's coming from the north, and we see that Arcturus is also from the north, we know when the Lord comes at the end of seals, he's coming on heavenly Mount Zion from the north with paradise. The mountain of the Lord carved without hands. And it's confirming to us that booties speaks of Christ returning in power as ruler. Booties is pictured as a man with a sickle in one hand and a spear in the other. He, ha uh, he appears as like the Son of Man who will reap the harvest of the earth associated with Revelation 14, 14, uh, 14, 14 through 16. Booties is home to the fourth brightest star, Arcturus, also called the coming one. There's, a, there's two things at play. We're showing this entire time the, the pre of it, not the pre-trip, but his coming as the 40 days from Luke's discourse, when he's coming on the eighth day to begin his 40 days. But it turns out within this, it appears it's also connected to when he comes as one like unto the Son of Man, 
when he comes with his sickle? Well, that's directly related, as they say, to Revelation 14.14. 14. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown in his hand and a sharp sickle. Well, Booties has a sickle, right? There's the sickle, and the crown, you can't see it. There's like a little piece right here. I think the crown is like right around here somewhere. I think right in here. So there's a crown right next to him as well, which again is very interesting. But you know what it you know what dawned on me as I read this? As I read that if this is Christ, we could see more than one picture of him. If he's a if it's a picture of him coming for 40 days in all of this incredibly deep revelation that we've shown here in this timing, then if this is the beginning of his 40 days, then whatever this time would equal six years from now, could it also be when the Son of Man is coming? Could it be the time frame of the coming of the Son of Man at the end of six years? And here's what I mean by that. Check this out. In Luke chapter 9, you guys will all know this if you've been following for a little bit as we start to, as we're just about done winding this down. Listen to what it says. Okay? We've, we've done a great teaching, right? There's a, 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 before the transfiguration, right? Luke, Mark, Matthew. Awesome, awesome, in-depth revelation. It was awesome. So crazy. And so what do we know about Luke 9.28? And it came to pass about in eight days after these things, okay? What do we know about this? We know that a pre-trib had happened first, right? The pre-trib, the, you know, the, the wedding had taken place. And this is a picture. This about in eight days has a dual picture, okay? For one, it is a picture of the seven years coming to an end, but we know it's not immediate. Right? We know that there's 50 days before the 14 years begins. And when the 14 years begins, it's the start of the next seven. So if the first seven are the easy seven, then there's 50 days before the next seven starts. And when that next seven starts, you can also say it's the eighth year, right? Let me show you. You can also say there's the seven easy years. And then when seals begins, the seven years of seals, seven years of trumpets, you could say the seven easy years come into an end. And then what? The first day, the, the first year of seals is also the eighth year. Remember in the big picture, 21 years and then the 22nd, seven easy, seven of seals, seven of trumpets, like the story of creation. This would be then the eighth year. So when he says about an eight days, meanings means it's almost the eighth year. And what do we know? Why would it say about where Mark and Matthew are very different? Well, because it's not quite the eighth day or the eighth year, right? It's, it's in that time frame of it. Well, guess what? It also applies to Christ in relation to about an eighth day being days. Because what do we have? You have the seven days of the wedding and he's coming at some point about the eighth day. It has a dual meaning in it. Okay? So now watch this. When he comes at this timing of about an eighth day, he is coming to begin his 40 days. When he comes to begin his 40 days, which we have taught on many times over the years, we've got some great teachings on it, it's a picture here of him coming to begin his 40 days in the prophetic. That's the, the typology in the picture. In Mark's, it's a picture of the end of six years of seals. In Matthew, it's a picture of the end of the six years of trumpets. So in this story, we know that it's a picture of what? Revelation chapter 6, the white horse rider, the first seal being opened. When the Son of Man comes as the white horse rider to begin his 40 days as the Son of Man. And he's coming to do it on about an eighth day, about a eighth year about to start. Okay? So we could see that. But what am I saying? Why am I relating it back to the white horse rider? Well, because the seals have actually started. 
the actual 14 years will begin at the red horse rider, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. But there's a count that may appear to begin at the time of the white horse rider. Considering it's one of the seals, it's not crazy to imagine that right here, when he comes, we know it's the time of the first seal being opened. So what am I getting at with this? We'll track this. If him coming on the eighth day after these sayings, on the eighth day after these sayings, which is to start his 40 days, well then, what about Mark chapter 9? When he comes in chapter 9 at his transfiguration story, it says after six days, which we know is six years. There's no type of six days. We know it represents the six years. So here's what I'm getting at. Watch this. If this is the beginning of the white horse rider, and this starts his 40 days, and then the 14 years begin around here, okay, in this time frame here of December, could it be that from Luke 9 to Mark 9, from the start of his 40 days on the eighth day to the end of of the six years, or as the six days, can it be that it's the same time? Meaning, yes, this is when he starts his, his 40 days, but it also starts the seals of tribulation, right? Of course, pre-trib is gone. Israel's been attacked in the north. Chaos is reigning on the earth. Everybody's been caught off guard. They can't understand what's happened. Millions of people have vanished. An attack happened on Israel. They want to settle everything down. And the Son of Man comes as the white horse rider, the first seal, on October 31st to November 1st. Could it be that six days or six years from this is when he returns, when he's seen coming, on heavenly Mount Zion? You see why I'm saying that? Because the connection to him is that in booties, he's not just he's not just the representation of booties with the sickle, but he's also the representation of the star called Arcturus, which is the coming one. And as this reaper of the harvest, we know that Revelation 14, in verse 14, is a picture of him coming at the end of the sixth year of seals at the time of the great multitude rapture at the end of the sixth year of seals. So if he's represented here as Arcturus in booties, and he's also a picture of the one coming with the sickle represented of when he comes from the north on heavenly Mount Zion, and we know it's at the end of six years. Could the count be from the beginning of the 40 days as the white horse rider that the six years of seals end from the beginning of the first seal white horse rider that started his 40 days? You follow what I'm saying? Go back and listen and track it through again that it may very well be that the white horse rider, first seal, the start of the 40 days of the Son of Man, will also be the timing of the end of the six days or six years of seals because he's represented as that star in the constellation of booties with the sickle that's coming, representative of when he comes from the north as Arcturus, the brightest star in the northern hemisphere, when he comes on Mount Zion from the north, which is heavenly paradise, coming up from the sea. This may not only begin the 40 days, but it may also equal the end of the sixth 
first six years of seals, meaning they would begin here and the six years would end right here when he comes on Zion. And what made me think about that was, as I said, seeing that his connection, if he is this picture of Arcturus, Arcturus and booties, then why would he only be represented in them as the timing of his 40 days? Wouldn't he also be the representation of Arcturus' booties when he comes with the sickle at the end of the six years on Heavenly Mount Zion, the place from the north? That just seems to make sense to me. Which would mean this is the start of his 40 days, and this, after six days, isn't six years from down here, which would have no connection to booties or arcturies. You see? We'd be way past it. But it would appear to actually be this same time frame six years later, meaning the six years in this count in Mark to the end of the sixth year of seals is a beginning, is a count that starts from the 40 days of the Son of Man from Luke. Something to ponder, something else we can consider, something else we can dig into and see how this timing of these things line up. But brothers and sisters, this was a lot, man. There was a lot packed into this, a ton of new information. And wow, wow, wow. This connection to this circuit, which appeared to be the sun, but is clearly connected to constellations or a star or this constellation star is completely in alignment to what had been previously revealed with a year's end to another year's end. To see that this ending and beginning that we've talked about from the Gospel of Thomas with a beginning starting from the beginning as it was in Taurus being the end and starting the end from the beginning in Taurus leads us to a beginning and an end with John's gospel related to the Hebrew landing count of their end and their beginning, which starts with Genesis 1-1, the exact group of people leaving, which then brings us to a year's end connected to a circuit with Arcturus and booties connected to the white horse rider as the sun was coming up in the same place at the same timing, but for this star in booties called Arcturus, who is a herdsman who is coming to feed his sheep and his shepherds who will then go out to save those sheep in the time of tribulation directly related to the remnant from those that were taken at the beginning to go out as his shepherds to save his lost sheep. Wow. Oh my goodness. And to then discover that if we continued the Hebrew calendar count from a Taurus off difference because of the corrupted sun that when we do it we end up with the fifth month ninth day and the Lord coming at the two months as we have been sharing this whole time two months after his birth and when he does, it would be from the 9th to the 15th, which would be the equivalent of the true 9th of Av, fasting and mourning, to the true 7th month attack that comes in be after the 50 days. What are the chances that each and every one of those parts and pieces of things we have understood and tracked for the last four years and specifically watched for the last year 
would fall exactly in line with the last teaching not having realized it and it equaling this timing of Arcturus in booties. I I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. It is absolutely astronomical. And it is the final of all finals for the end of 70 years to be counted were all of these things as it was in the beginning could even possibly fall into line and will never do this again for se uh, for 30 more years this is absolutely wild you go if you haven't watched the last teaching and then combine it with this one and it is it is so impossible that all of it together equals this exact same time frame in everything that has been revealed together in it this is going to be some serious hard time sleeping we still got what a little over three and a half weeks to go this is so 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 exciting Actually, no, we got less than, yeah, three and a half weeks. Whew. Watch it again, guys. Take your time. Study it out. Track it with the last one, especially those who have really studied the last one. And it will blow your minds as it has mine. I love you guys. God bless you. God bless your families. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.